<laughs> yes, uh, it's we're live. Well, welcome back, everyone, and welcome to everyone online. We are very happy now to have uh, Mike Jordan up next with a keynote today. Um, I guess he needs no introduction. He's a professor of statistics and machine learning and computer science at UC Berkeley. And the floor is yours, Michael. All right, thank you. Um, hopefully, if there's any glitches, you'll let me know, but let me go ahead and get started. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as you're going to see, I'm a machine learning researcher, a statistician who's also become uh, deeply interested in economics and the kind of new interfaces that I see emerging between the fields. Sorry, uh, we don't see you or your slides. So I, I know you don't see me. Well, actually, I can have you see me, but the slides I was just about to share. I haven't done that yet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let me go ahead and share screen. And um, then hopefully I can get the talk up. Okay, in terms of seeing me, hopefully that works now. Okay, so it looks like we're good to go. Play from start. And I might be even be able to do full screen. Okay, all the fun of uh, long distance talks. Um, all right, so the title there gives a little bit of the flavor of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, you know, learning aware just means that we're going to use statistical data and statistical inference principles to try to design mechanisms. Um, and I really want to have incentives and kind of learning really brought together. Um, and then dynamics and forms refers to the fact uh, that I'm particularly interested in algorithms that have dynamical properties. And I'm interested in large scale problems where maybe they're equilibria, we want to find them, but it's unlikely the system is ever in equilibrium. Uh, in the real world, things are changing all the time and it's the movement towards equilibrium, which is of particular interest. Um, and so for someone with my background, uh, you know, dynamical systems and and learning algorithms and, and uh, rates of convergence. It's all about kind of the dynamics. Um, okay, so let me just say a couple of words about machine learning, which is this kind of, uh, let's call it engineering discipline. It's not really a new field in my view. It's kind of statistics bl uh, blended with computer science um, and then aggregating all kinds of other problem solving techniques from nearby fields. Um, but, uh, you know, it's become particularly uh, present, uh, you know, um, and impactful recently. Um, but in a limited way. And so I, I tend to think of what's happened is, is what we used to call pattern recognition. And uh, this is deep neural nets and so on. So they, they take in lots of data, labeled data particularly, and, and they solve regression problems. Uh, but they do it at an unprecedented scale. And, um, uh, you know, they become a commodity because they're software platforms that allow you to work at that scale. Uh, but still, it's just pattern recognition, meaning that there's an input and there's an output, and um, perhaps there's some kind of dimension reduction or some kind of um, you know feature finding. Uh, but still, that's not decision making, and it's not dealing with kind of interactions between agents and so on and so forth. Um, and so you see a lot of the people in the field, the machine learning field, say, well, "Yes, we we admit that." So we have reinforcement learning, which solves all the other problems. Uh, but reinforcement learning is just kind of a, you know optimization. Um, it's a dynamical optimization. So. Um, those are very limited perspectives, and what I want to emphasize today is the decision-making side, which is not new. It goes back to, you know, uh, well, certainly in centuries, really, you know, in statistics, but, uh, you know, decision-making in the 30s was formalized, and then people like, you know, Blackwell and, and von Neumann and others kind of made it a discipline and uh, linked it with economics. So that's where I want to get to is high-stakes decisions and then all the way to interacting decision-makers where we have scarcity. Um, so let me just say a couple more words, though, about pattern recognition. Um, and by this, I really mean, you know, predict, you know, what's in the image um, or predict, um, you know, what's been spoken in a speech stream or or perhaps, uh, you know, vet a loan. Um, so there are still, you know, many open problems, really. They're, 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 they've been studied a lot, but they're not solved. And um, um, you will see people in, again, the pattern recognition side agreeing with this. Um, but I don't think they have kind of the right overall framework for addressing them. So certainly uncertainty, uh, you know, calibrated notions of confidence at the scale of these big neural nets or these big applications. Um, you see lots of ad hoc mechanisms to talk about uncertainty. Uh, you occasionally see some principle like the bootstrap or the jackknife or whatever applied, um, but there's no convincing argument that it should work at the scale it's being applied to. Um, there's lots of discussion about robustness and adversaries, but kind of in a limited way that, you know, the 
the adversary just kind of you know puts you on the wrong side of a boundary. Um, and robustness really is a word that kind of cries out for economic thinking. Uh, biases and fairness, as you know, Max and others uh, have worked a great deal on this. Um, and so now we're really bringing people into the mix. It's not just the algorithm. And, and so it has, you've got to start talking the language of utilities and, and uh, preferences and, and so on. Um, and then explainability, interpretability. Again, if you have people involved, they're going to want to be able to audit things. They're going to want to be able to convince that the answer is uh, to be trusted and so on and so forth. So long story short, I think these are all, you know, you know decade long challenges. Uh, but if you don't have an economics point of view, they, they kind of uh, seem like separate problems, and they're not. They're all linked, and they have got to be addressed together. Um, all right, so to, as a kind of a thought experiment that I've used, this is, in fact, really motivated me to start uh, you know, incorporating economics ideas in my own thinking and my own research. Um, I started thinking at some point, maybe half a decade ago, about recommendation systems. Um, you know what they are. You know, if you buy a few books on Amazon, it starts to recommend books to you. And it does that by a pattern recognition scheme where it matches you to other people in the database or the items you match, uh, the items you've selected are matched to other items and so on. So this very much on the prediction side of ML. Um, it's, it's certainly been highly consequential in real life. You know, business models have been built around it. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a very you know, billion dollar economy has been built around recommendation systems. And I'd say that's more, that's probably the biggest success in machine learning ever. Um, um, a lot of the hype you see nowadays is about systems that have not led to billion dollar economic, um, you know, value. Um, and, but it's, it, it's also kind of limited. It's been for things like books and movies and all where, uh, you know, that's part of important part of commerce, but these aren't really particularly consequential decisions, you know, deciding whether, you know, watch one movie versus another is not life and death. Um, and so there's not been any discussion of uncertainty and, and, you know, and, and there's some about biases and fairness, but it just seems, seems less consequential. When you move over to more consequential decisions, you, you start to see the limitations of, of the paradigm quite quickly. So, um, you know, Amazon, when it became popular, started recommending books to people at very large scale. And um, each person was treated independently. They came into the big, you know, system uh, with some big, you know, 100,000 dimensional feature vector. Um, and a recommendation was made for them. And then that was happened later in the day for somebody else. And um, and so it was quite possible to recommend the same book to 10,000 people uh, in a given day, or probably even 100,000 people. And the same thing with movies and Netflix. Um, and in the computer science world of kind of in the computer, the, the, everything is just bits. There's no scarcity. You can copy the bits as much as you want. You can copy the movie. And even nowadays with books, you can copy them within a day or so. Um, so, you know, um, People, you know, took the paradigm then into other domains where this was became uh, clear that there was a limitation. So you would see people taking the, the commodity recommendation systems and making, say, restaurant recommendations with it. Um, you know, if your friends have gone to certain restaurants and you've gone to certain restaurants and, you, you know, you transfer the recommendations. Um, and at small scale, this is not, you know, no problem. But if everybody in a certain city is starting to use the app, which, of course, is the goal, um, then you could easily send 10,000 people to the same restaurant. Uh, you, so you've created congestion. And, and of course, this was observed for also recommendations like, uh, you know, what's the fastest route to the airport? If you send everybody down the same route, it's no longer the fastest. Um, and so people started to see, oh, I see, we're creating congestion. This is a problem. We have to fix this. Um, but I don't think the mindset was quite right. I think they thought of it as a load balancing problem. Let's just make sure we don't send too many people down each street. We have a you know cap on it. Um, but, you know, if you're an economics person, you sort of say, well, obviously, that's got to be an economic decision. I'm going to have to, you know, I'm not going to just randomly choose people to li limit service to them. I'd like to ask, you know, ask, say, their utilities. And maybe, um, you know, someone's in a particular hurry today. It's an emergency. They should get the fast route. And someone else just doesn't mind to go a little slower. Maybe there's some kind of currency where I save money if I go down a slower route today for, for a trip later. Um, and with restaurants, you know, there's going to be recommendations being made. I, you know, I, I may have certain preferences for the kind of restaurant and restaurants have certain desires, maybe to have, you know, people from out of town or, or a certain age range or something. Um, and so on both sides of a two-sided market, there's going to be recommendations being made and there's a matching process. So that's really the right way to conceive of it. Um, really, what we're talking about here is not creating a recommendation system, um, uh, it's really creating a two-way market. Now it functions eventually as making recommendations, but it really make, it functions as making decisions. 
So it's really going to give you an offer of a restaurant to go to. Uh, you know, a bid will be made from the restaurant to you. Uh, you will accept that bid and uh, transaction will be made in that you pay actual money and you go and eat it at the restaurant. And um, in a two-way market, you can't send 10,000 people to the same restaurant. The, the, the kind of the market dynamics don't permit that. Uh, but it also brings in utility and it matches people on the basis of preferences. Um, okay, so this is kind of obvious at some level, but it was just somehow not obvious to people building recommendation system based, you know, business models and, um, you know, creating, you know, lots of problems. And so I think, I think this is just kind of typical is that people don't really think about the decision making side and the consequences of deploying a system in a society um, and um, that, that requires some economics. Now, is this just, okay, let's make sure we, you know, have a microeconomist in the room or a game theorist in the room. Well, you know, no, because a lot of the work in that field doesn't have a lot of um, concern with statistical inference and, and data. Uh, so you assume often, you know, uh, that you have a prior and it's the Bayesian prior and the prior is assumed known. You don't know the value that a person has, but you know the distribution of the values. And given all of that, the machinery kind of kicks in. So it's only recently you started to see people say, well, I don't know that prior. I'd like to dispense with the prior altogether, or I'd like to at least collect data and start to do inference on that prior. And maybe I now have repeated games and, and so on. And you know, start to see a merger of the fields. Um, so probably many of you in the room are of this kind of little category of people working on this, but I would say still it's very limited, both in economics and machine learning for people to see the, uh, the compelling need to, to interface these two sorts of classes of ideas. Um, and statistics is not just machine learning in the sense that it's a richer, deeper discipline. It has causal inference in it. It has confidence intervals. It, you know, it has uh, concern with experimental design and so on that, you know, over the years, machine learning has started to, to recognize. But those are the kind of concepts that are needed uh, to, to drive microeconomics. All right. So I, I, I want to make this really concrete because one of the, um, you know, the, the arguments I'm making here is this is the real world. If you don't face these problems, you're not going to you know, do th the right thing in the real world. It's, it's not just an academic argument. Um, so I've been involved in a, in a, in a company really that's um, now quite successful. It's called United Masters. And, um, and this was, uh, you know, uh, so most of the music industry is kind of at best a recommendation system based. It just takes, um, you know, so people will upload their music to say a site like SoundCloud, SoundCloud and, um, and then a site like Spotify will take that music and stream it to people. And then recommendations will be based on that. And, and Spotify will try to make money off of this with a subscription model or some advertising. Um, but the people who actually made the music kind of lost back in the, you know, uh, they just, you know, uploaded their songs and they, they were no longer in a market at that point. They were, uh, they, you know, they were not able to value their, their product. Um, and now Spotify starts to make enough money, they feel obliged to give a little money back to the people who made some of the songs, at least the, the ones that were, uh, you know, the, the influencers, the most popular songs. Uh, but that's not a market kind of, you know, generously offering to give a little bit of money back to people who made something. That's no good. Um, all right. So th this perspective, I think, became extremely clear in the world of music that um, nowadays more people are making music than ever before in history by a factor of 100. Uh, more people are listening to music than ever in history. Um, and if you look at the data, like 95% of the songs being listened to today around the world are songs written in the last six months and written by people you never heard of. Uh, and that, that is the world we live in. So you think, wow, that's a fantastic market that is producing this kind of you know, cultural phenomenon. And the answer is no, there's no market whatsoever. There's a few people that are still making huge amounts of money to be a musician like you know, Beyonce. Um, but most of the, that's not the person that people are listening to. They're listening to young 16-year-old artists that they know about because their friends know about them and so on. Um, all right, so this is quite broken um, and computer science and statistics, you know, should be able to step in and help out. And so that's, that's what this company, United Masters, has done. And this, the CEO, Steve Stout, there is the one who had this vision. And I've been a scientific advisor for them, to them. And at the end of the day, this was literally a two-way or a matching kind of market, a two-way market perspective, uh, rather than just to say a recommendation system perspective. So each musician has a dashboard they see at the end of the week, and they see a um, you know a dot every you know it's a map say of the uh, of the UK, and you see a dot every so time someone listened to one of your songs in the last week. Um, and so you might discover that you know in Leeds you are very popular. You know, ten thousand people li uh, listened to some of your songs last week. Um, and so you could then, um, 
you know, have someone contact the venue owners in Leeds and say, hey, look, I'm popular in your town. And moreover, I even know who's listening to my songs. There's a connection. I'm in a market. Um, and they say, sure, come give a show and you could make, you know, 10,000, you know, $10,000. Um, and if you do that, you know, three times during the year, you start to have a salary. Um, and so this, this, you know, and moreover, it's a real market and you can start to imagine now brands looking at this and wanting to associate themselves with musicians and so on. But anyway, that's what's happened. So uh, Steve Stout has created this company. Um, it has 2 million musicians now signed up on, on the platform. Their music is being sent to the United Master site, not to a record company. Um, and brands like the NBA, the National Basketball Association are using this music rather than uh, music from record companies, rather than Beyonce. If you see a clip of the NBA, um, you'll hear music behind it. And that music is United Masters artists and they're getting paid the money. So the, there's a small transaction fee. There, there's not the usual record company, you know, we take all the money situation. Uh, so this is creating employment for, you know, you know the roughly 2 million young people, mostly young people, 16 or 18 year olds uh, in the US. And, and of course the model could, you know, easily be done in Brazil, you know, Africa, um, you know, India, et, et cetera. Um, um, so, uh, you know, this is a way to think about AI as kind of creating a market and therefore creating jobs and creating and, and all it's doing is kind of taking the data that's flowing around in, in, on, on the network and saying those that data has economic value. And it's not just the data itself. It's the actual connection between who who made the data and who listened or who took the data. And, and so you can imagine this kind of model being used for other things, um, you know, news, uh, writing, other kinds of arts and so on. Um, all right. So anyway, that's kind of the driving motivations that got me interested in these problems. Um, and then if you start to look at what are the intellectual challenges, well, there are many. And, uh, you know, most of these are not new. In fact, I like to kind of mention people like David Blackwell in the 50s who are already were definitely thinking this way, simultaneously an economist and a, and a statistician and a, and a computational person. So relationships among optima equilibria and especially, again, dynamics. Um, as I've alluded to, multi-way markets in which you have to explore to learn your preferences because there's you know, if you think about restaurant recommendations, I don't know my preferences a priori. There's some rough data on my past history uh, that gives some idea, you know, like a certain, I like spicy food or I like a certain price point. But today I might have a different preference because I'm just interested in something different or I read something or whatever. Um, so that's more like a real market. Um, you have to explore in a market to kind of find things. Um, and then recommendation systems being brought into markets. So, you know, both the consumers will have recommendations on the other for the other side of the market, but the other side of the market has got its own kind of things it'll it'll recommend to the, uh, on that uh, to each other, um, you know, in terms of their business model and who they're looking for, and uh, you know, sharing clients and so on. Um, and then all these other problems, as I've alluded to, with uncertainty quantification, learning your preferences. I will also mention contracts as well, kind of when incentives when you have asymmetric, um, you know, missing information. And how you use that to design experiments that are that lead to good inference. Um, so this is a new topic I want to uh, um, get to. Um, and then all the kind of things having to do with incentives and fairness and privacy and so on. Uh, these are all kind of quantitative economic notions, and bringing them together with data analysis, I think, is very much the the agenda of the of the era. Let me just make one more kind of philosophical remark, and then I'll move into some actual um, research vignettes. Um, so just, I think it's kind of helpful to recognize that there are three foundational disciplines being talked about here that, you know, go back, you know, decades, if not hundreds of years, statistics, economics, and computer science. And there's definitely blends already between these fields, but they're, they tend to be pairwise. So statistics meets economics, that's econometrics. Mostly econometrics has been measuring the economy, kind of help, helping out macro economics, uh, and less kind of being used in, say, in mechanism design, um, um, now, statistics meets computer science, that's basically machine learning, okay? And machine learning is kind of the engineering field that, that brings together ideas from those two disciplines. Uh, and then, of course, there's algorithmic game theory, which blends economics and computer science. Each of these three pairwise things doesn't really have the third element very much present. You know, so econometrics, I've alluded to, didn't have a lot of kind of mechanism design and computational algorithms. Machine learning didn't have much economics, and algorithmic game theory didn't have a lot of data analysis statistics. Of course, there are exceptions to all these things, and again, probably many of you in the room are you know, right in the middle of all of these things. But I, I would argue that uh, this has kind of been missed by people that think these fields have been blended together, that the, the real emerging problems are a blend of all three of them, and uh, we, can, we kind of don't have all the, the, we don't have that blend in place. And we're going to need new ideas. This is not just kind of take old ideas and put them together. 
Um, okay, so um, here's here's my outline. Um, I have five little kind of research vignettes. Um, I decided instead of just picking one of these and going through details, I, I kind of pick five and kind of give you enough of a, uh, you know, what, the picture of what's happening. Uh, the, all of these are papers on the archive and um, all of them are written within the last year. So pretty recent research. And um, uh, hopefully this will be kind of, you know, motivation for you to want to go follow up on those things. Um, so I'm going to start with strategic classification and then I'm going to, the, the other highlight I think is going to be the work on contract theory, which I hopefully will get to. Um, okay, so this is work with Tiana and Eric, who are students with me at Berkeley. Eric's now at Caltech. Um, and this picks up on a small but important line of research going back about five years. Uh, people like Moritz Hart um, started, you know, talking about decision making in the face of strategic agents. Um, so, you know, when, when a strategic agent is asked for data, they will often kind of shade their data. They will lie a little bit because they have a desired outcome. So if you ask me to, you know, fill out a health insurance form, I'm trying to get the health insurance. I'm trying to get a good rate. So I'll, I will act as if I'm more healthy than I, than I really am. Um, and so, you know, health insurance companies or insurance companies know this. And so they will uh, ask questions that are hard for you to answer, uh, that, you know, uh, with a lie. And so they'll say, well, how much do you exercise? That's kind of easy to say a lot. So they say, well, can you uh, let us opt into your cell phone for a day to, you know, and we'll measure all the accelerations as you move around during the day. And so people, you know, it's a little harder to fake, but it's not that hard to fake. People built little devices that move a cell phone around automatically and pretend that someone is moving around. Um, all right, so this is all part of a game. And in fact, it's kind of a sequential ongoing game um, and it has its own equilibria and it has its own properties. And we need to analyze those as, as, a, as a game. And this is really just good heart's law in, in, in economics. You know, so if you measure something, uh, people start to react to that, that uh, fact that it's being measured and they change their behavior accordingly. Um, okay, so the general problem is that we've got these feedback loops and learning or some strategic agents who are providing data, but it's strategic data. They, they are gonna not necessarily be veridical. They're not gonna be honest. Uh, decision maker, has a prediction loss in mind, maybe, you know, making sure that the right people get loans so they make money um, or that, you know, um, you know, good decisions for admissions are made and so on and so forth. Um, so they will gather the data, they will, they will build a predictive model, and then perhaps they have to actually reveal aspects of the predictive model back to the strategic agents. And this may be for regulatory reasons, they have to actually say what the model is, or for good business reasons. If they're not transparent, people will go somewhere else. Um, so they may not reveal all the parameters of the model, or they may say, we're using logistic regression or, or something like that, okay? Now, the strategic agents see that and they realize, uh, you know, oh, I see, it's that kind of model. If I move my data in a certain way, that's more likely to give me a pre preferred outcome, um, you know, but it's not going to be, they can't arbitrarily move their data without some pain. There'll be a cost to moving, to, to altering the data. Um, so we want to build a model that puts all this together. How do we adapt to each other's actions? And moreover, now, what is the equilibrium and what are the dynamics that achieve that equilibrium? All right, so this is a form of a Stackelberg game, uh, but it's a special kind of Stackelberg game where there's, uh, it's a statistics game where the, the best response on one side is to build a statistical model and the best response on the other side is to provide data for that model. Okay, so um, in Stackelberg games, you have to kind of think about who's the follower and who's the leader. Um, you know, it, it, you get different kinds of answers in different situations, depending on who's the leader and the follower. And so in, in many of these games that you see in real life without people having analyzed it very much, uh, the decision makers just naturally assume to be the leader. Um, they kind of set up the game. They maybe have more computational power um, now, but it's, it's turned out in the early work that looked at this, um, it was realized that uh, in, in these statistical settings, that when the decision maker is the leader, they have too much power somehow. It's very, it's pretty favorable for them, but it's it's very unfavorable for the strategic agents. Um, the, the equilibrium is not the, the welfare of the strategic agents is, is can be quite low. All right, so we wanted to kind of understand this a little bit better, and we started thinking about uh, the dynamics uh, that was involved here in these games. And uh, you know, these are repeated games, and so you have to kind of think about what what sort of the time scales. And uh, so the, the, the way this has been set up generally is that there's kind of very synchronous behavior. A model is published and then people best respond with data. And then, then the model is updated and then people best respond again. And um, that, that's really not reality in many situations. There's no reason to have the same timescale for the agents and the decision maker. 
Um, and so it could be that the decision maker decides to be slow, update the model infrequently, and the agents are now responding you know, at a more rapid time scale. There may be many, many agents, for example, um, or it could be the other way around. Um, so we really want to add, ask, uh, you know, what, are, what kind of equilibria do we get in, in these other kind of more broad class of uh, situations? And are they favorable uh, equilibria uh, for one side or the other? Um, okay, so here's one where the decision maker is slow relative to the agents. In our, in our language, we call these proactive decision makers. And are there examples of this? Well, yeah, sure. These are more classical. So college admissions, um, you know, uh, or, you know, credit scoring would be ones where you have this model. Um, you know, why? Well, because if the, you know, the college changes its criteria after every little bit of data comes in, that would be chaos. It'd be confusing to the applicants. And so colleges wouldn't do that. They don't. They change it to maybe every year or two, uh, their criteria. Um, okay, so this is very, very not, this is often maybe in some ways the more common model, but the IT world um, kind of reverse things where, you know, YouTube, it, it will update its model continuously as, as fast as it can. And, um, you know, it does it because it has computational power and it wants to somehow get the most revenue and, and so on. So it, it does it as quickly as possible. Uh, so we call it the reactive setting. Okay, so now you have enough mathematics that you can start to analyze this. This is a statistical game. Uh, now we put in a particular form of, of best response, say build a logistic regression model and um, we, put, you know, we, we, put, we write down the Stackelberg dynamics and we analyze these things. Okay, so I'm just gonna tell you briefly what the results are, um, um, details in the paper. Um, well, so first of all, it turns out that with either order of play, you do get equilibria here. Okay, so that's good. Um, now, that's not that surprising, but it's, it's true. But here's the more interesting result, which is that in these statistical settings, in particular for generalized linear models, it turns out that both players prefer the equilibrium where the strategic agents are the leaders and the decision maker follows. So this is the proactive model. The decision maker is slow and the strategic agents are fast, but more like the college admissions model. Um, so it's not surprising that the um, agents are happier here because they were very unhappy. They had bad welfare in the other model. Um, but what's surprising is that the decision maker is also happier here. Okay, and so uh, in the paper, you'll see real, you know, you know, real data analyses where this actually is, is borne out, but it really is a theorem. Um, uh, so that's certainly not true of all Stackelberg games, but it's true of this, of this class of uh, Stackelberg games that we you know, call in statistic, statistical Stackelberg games. Um, so in some sense, that's a kind of a new theorem in game theory. It's, it's not you know, true of all arbitrary games, but it's true of a certain class of interesting games. Okay, so that was vignette number one. Um, you know, vignette number two is going to be about uh, mechanism design for matching markets where we have exploration. And so I'm going to, this will be in two phases, kind of, we had two projects that kind of link together. Uh, the first one, I think, is the best motivation. And the second one provides the stronger mathematical tool. So this first one was with Lydia Liu and Horia Manny, and it kind of is very much this, you know, restaurants um, match with diners kind of, you know, model. Um, so we're going to, put on the learning side uh, you know of this interface the the multi-arm bandit so as i'm sure you all know multi-arm bandits are a way to think about uh, decision making where you don't a priori know what's the your preferences so you have to explore um, and so you would pull one of the arms um, and you'd get a reward from some unknown distribution and uh, you would explore maybe try the other arm and see what reward you get and um, over time you would build some kind of a model of each one of these arms and you don't need a full probability model, but what you do is, you know, may, maybe you need something like a confidence bound. And uh, the upper confidence bound algorithm will take the upper bound of these confidence intervals. Uh, these are confidence intervals for the unknown re average reward or mean reward. And um, the UCB algorithm is kind of this beautiful idea that the upper confidence bound, you know, it's gonna be high for one of two reasons. Either the whole distribution has a high mean reward and it's shifted over to the right, so you should pick that arm because uh, for exploitation reasons, or um, it's high because you have a lot of uncertainty about that arm. So you should pick that arm for exploration reasons. You wanna reduce your uncertainty. Uh, so in any, in any case, you pick the uh, upper confidence bound and now you can prove that this converges. Um, uh, and so you, in, in a sense of regret. So um, if, if you compare to an Oracle that knew a priori, which is the best arm, and they just simply pick that arm again and again and again, uh, then in retrospect, you look about how, how good was your performance relative to that Oracle, 
Um, and and uh, this particular algorithm has logarithmic regret right, related to that oracle. Okay, so um, and that's that's known to be optimal here. Um, so here's a algorithm that doesn't need to know preferences a priori over a set of actions. It forms them and it it manages exploration exploitation. It doesn't. It's not told what to do like in supervised learning. It's figuring out what to do. All right. Now on the microeconomic side, we're gonna we're gonna uh, uh, work with matching markets. Um, so here you have a two-way market, buyers and sellers. Um, and um, here you assume that the preferences are known a priori. Okay, so you know, buyer number one prefers seller number one to number three to number two. And for all buyers and all sellers, we assume we know the preferences a priori. Um, and uh, then you run deferred acceptance or some other algorithm that is uh, known to have favorable um, uh, uh, equilibria. So they are stable in the sense that there's no pair of buyer and seller who would prefer to have a, uh, a matching, a different matching than the one they have. Um, okay, so uh, does, is this useful in the real world? Well, yeah, people you know, got Nobel Prize because this was useful in the real world uh, and college admissions and so on are, are typical examples. But even there, it's sort of you know a little dubious that people really have you know um, preferences on the entire side of the market. You know, I you know I I would help my child with college admissions this year. My child definitely did not have strong preferences among all the universities that were being applied to, and then vice versa. Um, so there really needs to be kind of more of a real social learning kind of model here, where people will share information and there's recommendation systems kind of being brought to bear. All right, so uh, you know, to, to start to model such a thing and make it, make it a field, um, we're going to bring these two ideas together. We now have participants in a market who are observing the other side via uh, you know banded algorithms. So now, just imagine there are two uh, agents, and they're both trying to figure out which arms they prefer. And if they pick separate arms, that's no you know nothing changes. But if they happen to occasionally pick the same arm, um, now we have a, you know congestion. We have a scarcity. Uh, and so we have to think about what to do here. And so our model says that one of the agents gets the reward and the other agent gets no reward. All right, so which agent gets the reward? Well, that's determined by the other side of the market, which has its own preferences, which it may also be learning. And so here agent two, or sorry, uh, arm two prefers the bear to the, to the human. Um, now the human sees that and they say, well, I like arm two. Um, all else being equal, I'd be pulling arm two. But I see when I pull arm two and the bear pulls it, the bear wins and I don't get any reward. So I need to pull some of the arms more than I otherwise would. Um, and so that uh, that statement is kind of an exploratory statement. I have to explore more than I otherwise would because of the competition in the market. And so that should lead to a higher regret. And so we want to quantify the high the higher regret due to competition. Um, all right. So so we were able to do that in a kind of a you know. Uh, hand, you know, in a, in a, in a particular analysis um, in this bandit market. And we, first of all, had to, of course, define regret. And without getting into too many details here, it's a pretty natural notion. We define what we call the stable regret, which is that if a priori uh, essential decision maker knew all the preferences of everybody, they would then do a Gail Shapley style matching. And, and then we want, uh, and then we compare to that in retrospect, how well did you do relative to that stable matching? Uh, so that's the stable regret. And we're able to prove that um, a specific regret minimizing algorithm, which just simply does Gail Shapley, but now on the upper confidence balance. So you don't assume you know the, the preferences, you, you work with the UCB algorithm. That algorithm actually has logarithmic regret still. Okay, so we, we were able to prove that you, uh, the, the competition doesn't hurt you in terms of the actual growth, uh, the, the, the rate of convergence. Uh, but it does, there is a, a term there, delta squared in the denominator, which is the overlap among the preferences. Um, and so if there's a high overlap, um, so the delta is small, um, then uh, this increases the regret, but it's only by a constant factor. Okay, so we're able to quantify the loss of uh, efficiency due to uh, competition, um, but, and we find that it's only a constant. Um, okay, so you know how do we prove that theorem? I, so I don't want to get into that detail. I want to tell you there's a better way to prove this kind of theorem in more generality. And so I'm going to kind of briefly allude to a, a follow-up paper um, that looked more broadly at learning equilibrium and matching markets from banded feedback. And this is with a number of colleagues at Berkeley, um, uh, Mina, Alex, Yishin, and Jacob. Uh, where we're looking at uh, equilibrium and matching markets more generally, in particular, we're going to look now at transferable utilities. 
Uh, so the college admissions case is a case where, you know, the Gail Shapley case um, is a case where you don't have any money. So you simply match and, you know, the college doesn't pay the student to come. Well, maybe they, they give them a fellowship, but, uh, um, you know, kidney exchange is another example where you don't pay for the kidneys. Um, but in all, lots of other markets like, you know, Uber or whatever, there's, there's a transfer, there's a transfer uh, money is paid for when you do a matching. And this is known as the shapley schubert model, and it's it's a richer class of models. Um, and so, uh, in in thinking about how to uh, talk about dynamics in these shapley schubert models and not just equilibria, you know, we wanted some kind of a Lyapunov function, some kind of a not just that you're stable or not, but a quantitative measure of instability. Okay. And so, if you're highly unstable in a certain configuration, we want to function that tells me how to adjust the parameters to make you more stable. So that's what you do as a kind of dynamical systems person. Um, all right, and so um, you know, that's what we've done. We've introduced a novel measure of instability. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna show you on this one slide what it is. And uh, you know, if, again, I don't wanna get into details, but um, you'll see it uh, explained in the paper. Um, and, and basically it has a pretty clear economic interpretation. This is kind of like a VCG or a, or uh, you know, a Shapley value kind of thing. It's looking over all subsets of the agents. That's that outer maximum, and then it's looking at utilities you get in the in, you know in, in, in the set of matchings, and it's subtracting off utilities plus the transfers. Okay, so um, that already has a bit of an economics flavor to it. But if you take the dual of this problem, then it turns out to have even a clear economics interpretation. Uh, in the dual, you see that uh, this measure is the minimum amount that the platform could subsidize agents to achieve stability. All right, so if in the current figure configuration, uh, it's unstable, um, uh, the platform could add a little bit of money in so that no one wants to switch. And the minimal amount of money that needed to be added in so that no one wants to switch, that's a quantitative notion of how far you are away from stability. Um, and so um, if you kind of have a background in numerical linear algebra or control theory, this is pretty natural. Like how far are you away from a singularity that measures kind of the relative amount of stability in the system. And so we're kind of doing that same thing here in an economic setting. Um, all right. So once you write down these, these problems, in particular the dual problem, uh, then you can now optimize over those problems and um, you know, move towards stability um, and then get convergence rates. And, and when you take this framework and apply it back to the problem, that I talked about um, in the bandits markets setting, you get that logarithmic rate that I was telling you about. Okay, um, so this is the, uh, you know, the general story is that there's kind of an optimism principle that can be applied more generally uh, to this primal dual formulation of matching. All right, um, now I think I've got a couple of things left to do. Um, Max, if you can hear, can you remind me of how much time I have at this point? Uh, you have 10 minutes left. 10 minutes left. Okay, that's perfect. Or 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, but 10 is ideally. Okay, so let me, uh, so I have some slides on this contract uh, stuff. And it, um, I'm gonna, what I'm going to need to do, though, is to bring up my other set of slides, because I, I tried, this, this is brand new work, and I tried this morning to um, merge them into the same PowerPoint file, and it was a big mess. So I have a different set of slides that were not mergeable. Okay, hopefully you can see them. Uh, let me start, play from start. Um, okay, so this is a brand new topic. Um, we're going to call this statistical contracts. Okay, so contract theory is an area of um, a mechanism design where you have a principal and an agent. So there's an asymmetric relationship, uh, which is not true of lots of other areas in, in, in um, microeconomics here. There's the, really the asymmetry. So the, the agent knows something the principal doesn't know, and the principal wants to get the agent to do something. Okay, so, all right, so um, first of all, this is work with Stephen Bates, Michael Sklar, and Jake Soloff, um, colleagues at Berkeley and Stanford. Um, and what we're going to try to do here is to use contract theory, um, uh, you know, which is usually used kind of as a way to get revenue out of a system. So if you're the airline and you're trying to fill the, the airplane, you know, why do you have economy and business fares? Well, because you don't know how much people value this, you know, how much they are willing to pay. You can't just ask them because the people who are willing to pay more would kind of try to underbid. And uh, you can't just set one price because, um, you know, only the people, uh, you know, who uh, the people who uh, were willing to pay more would pay for that happily. And you've lost money there. And then people who are not willing to pay so much, you can't set the price too high. 
Um, so you set two prices and that, that kind of allows people to look at it and say, okay, I see that lower price. I prefer that I lose a little bit of services, but um, you know, overall I'm, I'm happier with that. And then, and for the people willing to pay a little more, they like the extra services. And so everybody's a little happier. The social welfare is higher. All right. Now, so that's the classical setting of um, contract theory. Um, and we're going to bring this into contact with statistics. So here we're going to set up contracts that allow us to get data from people who otherwise wouldn't be willing to reveal the data, you know, veridically, truthfully. And so we're going to set it up in a way so that uh, when they pick some uh, item in a, you know, in a, out of a menu of contracts, that will reveal some information to us. And we are statisticians, and we're going to do Bayesian inference on the information that's, that's revealed to us via the choice from a menu of contracts. And then we can do hypothesis tested and all kinds of Bayesian inference that we would normally do when we just collect data. Okay, so it's a way of collecting data using contracts for the purposes of statistics. All right, so the setting here uh, is, is a real world one. Um, you know, so the FDA in the, in the US is, you know, Fed Food and Drug Administration is trying to decide whether to approve drugs that are being proposed by companies, you know, uh, pharma. Um, the companies know internally maybe how well their drug works a little bit because they've tested it out maybe on a small population, um, you know, but no one really knows if the drug's really going to work at large scale. So the FDA will run a clinical trial. Now, those are costly. And so they kind of like to incentivize companies not to send, um, you know, bad drugs so that they have to test them and spend a lot of money. Um, you know, and, and then the companies, though, if they send bad drugs, um, you know, they should have to kind of pay a penalty for that somehow. And, and, and moreover, but if they have a good drug that they know internally is really looking good, they should be kind of eager to get it, you know, to the FDA. So we need to set up some incentives for this, not just kind of collect data and, and go. All right. So, um, all right. So now if we think of this from a statistical point of view, let's just look at classical, you know, Neyman Pearson style hypothesis testing. Um, so there are bad, good drugs and there are good drugs. And, um, you know, if I approve or not approve, that's, I can get type one and type two errors. So we might say, well, if it's a bad drug and I approve it, that's a, you know, it's a you know, type one error. I'm going to cap that at 0.05. Um, if it's a good drug and I don't approve it, that's a type two error. So I'm going to cap that at 0.2. Um, and that's kind of standard numbers for statistical hypothesis testing for clinical trials. All right. Now, is this good in this domain? Well, it depends on the, on the incentives. So in case one there, I've shown you where Suppose it costs $20 million to, uh, to run a trial. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to pay $20, $20 million. Uh, if the drug is approved, you're going to make, say, $200 million in profit. Okay. Um, all right. So again, it's statistical setting. So um, even if the drug is not really effective, um, you know, it's, it's the null hypothesis true. Um, there's some chance that when the FDA runs the clinical trial, it'll, it'll, you'll get a false positive. It'll look like it was actually a good drug. And so the company then would be a license to uh, put the drug on the market, you know, and assuming the drug is not a, you know, a drug that hurts people, um, you know, it would be on the market and then, you know, it takes some time for people to realize this is not very effective. And then someone else would come up with a better drug. But in the meantime, they would make $200 million. Uh, however, the statistical setting there, um, if you just put, you multiply out the probabilities and calculate the expected value of your profit, uh, given that you, they actually don't have a good drug, well, it's minus 10 million. So you wouldn't do this. On the other hand, if, um, you know, it's a different kind of drug and, you, you know, it's $20 million to play the game, but you would make two, 2 billion if you're approved, uh, then your expected profit here, even if you have a bad drug, is 80 million. So you would definitely be incentivized to send lots of drugs to the, to the FDA. Um, all right. So, uh, you know, we need to find a way to, to, to fix this. And so we're going to use contract theory where the principal is the FDA and the agent has this private information. And we'd like to then set this up in a way that we set up a menu of contracts that incentivize the agent to make decisions that reveal information to us as uh, in, in a hypothesis testing setting. OK, so again, details I don't really want to get into very much, but basically the setting is. The contract looks as follows. The agent knows something private, theta. They have to pay an amount R, all right? We're going to supply a menu of options to them. Uh, they're going to choose a payout function from that menu, okay? And um, once they've kind of gone this far into the problem, then we will actually uh, take the drug and we will sample uh, an outcome, Z, from the distribution that's based on the true parameter. 
and we'll get an observable outcome that everyone gets to see. The agent at that point will get the payoff, and it depends on you know whether it was it looked like a good drug or not. Uh, but then the principal will receive the utility based on on that uh, that payoff and based on whether it really is a good drug or not. All right. And so now you can set up the contract theory. You, you can you can assume the agent wants to maximize their payoff and the agent wants to the principal wants to maximize their utility. OK, so um, long story short, we're able to define a notion of incentive aligned contracts, which, get, which gets out maximal statistical information in this setting. Um, and so basically uh, being incentive aligned is very natural. It's just that under the distribution on that observable Z, okay, the, the, um, the utility for the agent F of Z uh, minus the payout is, is, is negative, okay? So if that, that's true for all parameter values and, and for the entire menu, uh, then we have an incentive aligned con contract, okay? So if, so uh, sorry, this is all for all theta in the null, in the null. So if you have a null drug, a bad drug, then in that situation, you should be have a negative expected utility minus the cost. Uh, and so you would not send your drug to the FDA in that case. Okay. All right. So it turns out we have now an if and only if characterization of what incentive aligned contracts are. So we use the notion of E values from statistics. Uh, these are not P values. These are different than P values, but related. Uh, an E value is a random variable whose expectation under the null hypothesis is less than or equal to one. And we're able to show that a menu of contract, uh, you know, a menu of options is incentive aligned if and only if every item in the menu is an E value. Okay, so uh, in a longer talk, I would kind of dig into that and explain it. Again, you can look at the paper, um, but it's sort of, you know, it's a natural connection between collecting evidence and setting up, you know, a menu uh, of, of contracts. And, you know, the, the, the proofs here are actually quite simple. Um, okay, so here's the overall theorem that a uh, menu is max bin. In other words, you're protecting yourself against worst outcomes, all right, if and only if the menu is. That's uh, the first foray into this, um, into this area. Um, I'm hoping to work with my colleagues much more on this over the coming couple of years. I think there's a lot to do here. And so let me finish with that and then return to the main talk and try to finish up pretty quickly. Um, Okay, so play from current slide. All right, so that's where we were. Um, so I'm going to skip this next little section with for one of time, but um, this is a little paper that uh, Winshow and Manolson I've done. Where we're interested in learning of auctions, so you don't know the preferences a priori, the valuations, um, and you don't know the distribution. So we're going to have repeated trials. And in this situation with strategic agents, you can imagine people giving you bad data so they can ruin the auction somehow or they can get prices set in such a weird way that later they can swoop in and, and get an advantageous price. So you need to be robust to that kind of agent. Um, and we've managed, managed to find a way to make Meyerson auctions robust in that statistical sense. So I'm gonna skip that, but if you're interested, there's a paper on that. Um, and the last couple of minutes, then I just want to uh, pull out a little bit of the fully you know, full focus on incentives and economics and say a little bit more about uncertainty quantification uh, because you know that, that underlies everything I've been talking about. If you don't do good uncertainty quantification, you can't make good decisions and you can't control errors and so on. And so how do you do uncertainty quantification? Of course, this is a hundred year old topic. Um, and um, you know, either you're Bayesian and you put it in a prior and you update the posterior, but you know, often you don't know what prior to use, or you're frequentist and you maybe have to do something like the bootstrap, which is intense computationally, or you make very strong assumptions and assume a normal distribution. And that's kind of typical of econometrics. None of those are very satisfying. And uh, so there is a new area, you know, that's, that's kind of due to Vladimir Falk in the 90s, uh, conformal prediction. And we've been building on that. Here are some of the colleagues I've been working with on this to do a new form of uncertainty quantification, uh, you know, that somehow had been missed over all these years. And what's the beauty of it is that it's completely non-parametric and it applies to um, you know, an arbitrary model and an arbitrary distribution. So it's distribution-free and non-parametric. Um, and uh, so you can take like a neural network or whatever, some complex state-of-the-art model that has dubious uncertainty quantification. That might even be a big Bayesian model where you threw in some prior and you get a posterior, but it's dubious whether it's really calibrated anyway. And what conformal methods allow you to do is to put a calibration layer on top of these complex models and, um, you know, it's basically kind of a quantile story. You kind of sort some quantiles and you find a cutoff 
And there's a kind of a beautiful theorem that says this is doing somehow the right thing in terms of calibration of these, these recalibration. So you can start talking about doing this on real world problems, like, you know, what's in the image or what, you know, what, you know, uh, in my medical situation, what's the probability of a tumor? Um, and let me just sort of say that um, at the end of the day, this becomes kind of just a statistical problem of setting a knob. You, you don't want too many false positives. You don't want too many false negatives. Um, but you also want to control, um, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, you want control over this over a large set of, of, of um, you know, of hypotheses, for example, like in an image. All right. So um, we've been able to do that with a, with a calibration procedure. We have several papers that do this in different ways. Um, but basically, at the end of the day, this is kind of there's a true risk underlying this. And it's not necessarily squared error. Uh, and then there's this empirical risk, which is not monotone but we're able to set a threshold value such that um, we control the overall risk below some desired value. Um, and so, uh, you know, this allows you to work with arbitrary risks. Uh, and um, here's an example of this. So for, uh, you know, this kind of breakthrough result in protein structure prediction by, by DeepMind, you know, annotating large numbers of proteins, um, they made a prediction, but they didn't have an error bar on that. And so we're able to put error bars on all of those uh, predictions uh, just as, I showed in that original picture, putting a calibration layer on top of their system. Um, and then this is my last slide. Uh, this is a state-of-the-art object uh, detection system. Uh, it's a big neural net that makes predictions. And on top of that, we're adding this calibration layer and we're getting a confidence interval, which is a set of labels. So it doesn't have to be a general, you know, classical one-dimensional confidence interval. It can be like a set value predictor. And so you see here that when there's uncertainty, you're predicting, well, maybe it's a uh, hyena, maybe it's a giraffe, I'm not sure. And what we're able to guarantee is that with probability 0.95, the true label is in the set of labels that I'm returning for each of the objects. So this is real statistical inference with real uncertainty quantification in a real high dimensional inference problem. Um, so uh, you know, again, this was just kind of quickly, just to make almost publicity. Um, if you're interested in this, there's uh, my student Anastasios and Stephen Bates um, have a website where there's downloadable code and there's a tutorial and there's kind of a bunch of slides and so on. Um, so I'd encourage anyone who's interested in uncertainty qualification to have a look and you know uh, see where that field is going. So I'm done there. I think that was the last slide. Yes, and I'm happy to have questions if there are any time for them. Well, thanks, Michael. That was great. Covered a lot of ground there. Let's see if there are any questions from the audience. Who dares to go first? All right, uh, let, let me get started. Um, I'm just picking out one, one of the things you talked about. So you talked about this paper on um, learning equilibrium matching markets. And so I, I guess I have to look at a couple of your papers on that. And I was wondering, so there's this, I guess, the uh, maximization of observed outcomes, like ratings or, or, um, or successful matches or something like that. But that seems like a different objective from what we would often think about in terms of, say, stable matching, where we care about utility and people's actual like um, reveal preferences. And so I was wondering how you thought about the disjoint between mean, observed outcomes versus utilities and thinking about stability there. Okay, so I'm Max. Unfortunately, I'm not hearing you very well at all. There's a there's a big echo, and I was not able to really. Maybe if you slow down. Um, Sorry. Um, so I was wondering, um, in your papers on learning equilibria and matching markets and stability, yeah. I guess you have objectives that correspond to some measured outcomes, like ratings. And then when we usually would talk about stability, say, in matching equilibria in economics, we would think about subjective utility, which is not observed. And so I was wondering how you thought about the disjoint between these two. Um, yeah, I mean, we haven't really uh, done much of that. You're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, we're kind of taking the the the, the numbers, um, you know, at face value. I mean, I really kind of have like, you know, a, a, an improved version of Uber in mind here. You know, in some sense, Uber, God bless them, you know, they, they did change the world of transportation a bit and they did it with a matching market. There was riders and riders and there was a transfer of money among them. They just, you know, and they had some economics people in, and learning people in, in, in Uber, but they were kind of creating it from scratch and, and they didn't create a particularly good market. And in fact, now that the pandemic's over, they're kind of rebooting the market as far as I can tell. And the prices, of, you know, the, the, the price me pricing mechanisms seems to have been very much changed. Um, but I have that kind of model in mind. So, you know, people, um, um, 
you know, have a subjective utility about all the experience that they had along the ride. But basically, they wanted to get from point A to point B, and they want to, you know, be treated well. And, um, you know, so there, and then there, you know, some kind of a rating afterwards. But really, it's, it's, um, you know, you know, I, I, I don't need a perfect ride. I'm just kind of trying to, there's a kind of a, you know, clear criteria, you know, that doesn't require a lot of internal investigation of my utility. You know, did I get a good ride? And similarly for like, you know, movies, you know, there could have been the perfect movie where my utility would have been particularly high, but I really kind of just wanted to be entertained and so on. So we're, we're kind of thinking about some of these real world problems and not being too concerned about uh, getting into, you know, the, 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 all the utilities behind them. Um, but, you know, that's a gap uh, in, in, in research. And I definitely would want to return to the, you know, revealed utility, revealed preferences and, you know, kind of issues that are, you know, the real economists would look at. Thank you. Who's next? So yeah, speak slowly because something saw so the microphone is uh, is has a very strong echo. Speak slowly as I can. So for the contract theory application we discussed, um, a lot of the ideas seems familiar from kind of gradual economics for the mechanisms where there's an agent with my information and I want to design pain structures so that agents would truthfully reveal their type to me and I'm going to do that in a way to maximize my profit or social welfare. But, um, so it wasn't like entirely clear to me what the statistical parts of the statistical contract theory meant um, outside of these very classical ideas and methods of design. You know, yeah, no, good, good question. Um, so, the, you know, in some sense, this is standard, you know, contract theory, um, you know, adverse selection is probably the one we focused on most. Um, you know, but it, it's, it's, um, it, the, the welfare here is type one, type two error. Okay, so that that, that is, um, um, or it could be like false discovery rate, you know. So it's it's uh, you know to a statistician that's everything. It's it's that okay, my welfare is not just some arbitrary unspecified utility. Uh, it, it's this quantity that we care about deeply in statistics, which is related to some underlying sampling model. You know, the, the drug works or not depending on the vagaries of the real world, and there's so on some underlying you know probability of given a theta of you know this uh, this hidden information. There's some probability in the real world of the test actually, you know, revealing that it's a good drug or not. And a statistician wants to you know, control the, the kind that, you know, the, the multiple kinds of errors that can arise in that situation. Um, and here, because you can't just get the data, you have to sort of set up a contract so that you get data for the purposes of getting low type one and type two error. Okay. So, the, you know, um, yeah, that, that's what's new basically is the, is it's just the statistical part, but the, uh, you know, the, the particular contracts, we, once you design the contract, it is contract theory. Um, but, you know, these contracts, uh, you know, for example, the, the theorem I, I, I mentioned is that uh, optimal contracts in this maximum sense for statistics are E values. Okay, so that's a new theorem. That's not a theorem that you'll see in contract theory. Uh, and so, you know, a contract being an E value, that, that's only meaningful and interesting in the statistical setting. Um, you know, so if you're not a statistician, maybe this will not, you know, say, well, okay, big deal. But I, if you're a statistician, this is a big deal. This is, you know, how do we make, you know, uh, cl you know, clinical trials decisions or whatever. And, and we're just adding in the use of contract theory to, you know, to say, well, we have to incentivize people to be um, providing their data. Uh, but yeah, just, I don't want to, yeah, insist too much about novelty here. It's not kind of my game. My game really here is to uh, say real world problem needs, you know, way of thinking X and X already kind of exists out there. Uh, it's just not being uh, deployed in this setting, you know, so you, you can look at all kinds of clinical trials literature and, and uh, statistical literature, you will see no hint of, you know, well, maybe the agent is, uh, has some un, you know, revealed information, or maybe, you know, like in the, um, um, you know, moral hazard situation, they, they may be incentivized to do something, you know, and so um, none of that, and, and that, you know, so actually when I mentioned to my economist friends, I'm working on contract there, they say, oh my God, that takes me back to when I, 40 years ago, when I was a grad student, you know, it's very classical in economics, um, you know, but a lot of my career has been going back to very classical ideas in nearby fields and saying, oh my God, it's been kind of forgotten, but here it's very, very appropriate for the modern situation. Okay. 
Thanks, Michael. Um, so one other question. Uh, the, in the very beginning, you mentioned that you would like to have a certain robustness towards or our models and predictions towards data that we haven't seen before, right? That data that is truly different from our training data. So the type of extrapolation you know. And I guess in all your applications, there was a lot of structure. Because in order to have extrapolation, you really need structure structural model, I guess. But I was wondering if this type of robustness, if you had other type of statistical methods in mind that would deliver a robustness towards this type of extrapolation, a true difference between the final application and the training data. Uh, yeah, no, great question. Um, let me just say I wanted to put the word robustness in the top because in other work, I, I do spend time on it. And I do think it has an economic side to it that economic, economics people just say, oh, they're looking for robustness. I know something about that. But I don't think there was a lot in this talk about robustness per se. Um, uh, there was a little part I skipped on the auction design part where it was about an economics form of robustness. But um, um, so just, you know, the elephant in the room in lots of machine learning applications, as you probably know, is that, uh, you know, you train on a very big data set and then within a couple of weeks, the, there's been non-stationarity, the data's changed enough that you start to predict pretty badly. And, um, and people, of course, have studied, you know, lack of robustness to, you know, when an adversary comes in and, you know, throws in some extra data and you suddenly do very badly. Um, but you know, really, the former kind is is the worst one, the non-stationarity. That really, the model will often not work within a few days, uh, and so you know, uh, you could ask the same question of a market. You know, if market is maybe working today, what's any guarantee that that market will still be working and be effective? You know, for the producers, consumers, and you know, delivering high social welfare, you know, in a year. And you know, the answers are going to be sometimes yes, sometimes no, but but they're a little different. You know, and markets often will last just for you know for decades or even centuries working relatively effectively and fairly adaptively. And that's so not true of our current kind of statistical machine learning systems um, that I just kind of want to bridge this. Okay, robustness sometimes is simply that, you know, agents adjust to each other, they're equilibria, there's uh, equilibria which are more or less stable. Um, you know, if we have a Lyapunov function, we can help design, you know, the, you know, the, you know reshape the equilibria and um and so on so I, I don't think my talk was certainly not replete with it the 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 auction thing i mean they're really what they at the end of the day we have a kind of a a convex uh relaxation of a myerson auction and that in that relaxation we become robust to um you know to arbitrary movements you know so some fraction of the data has been arbitrarily changed so like a statistician would look at you know the median is robust to you know 50 percent of the data can be arbitrarily changed and you still get the same result um, so we're going for that form of robustness, and we achieve that with this particular relaxation of a Meyerson auction. So I would call that a real robustness result, which has both statistical and economic side to it. Um, but I hope I'm kind of alluding to, I think this is 10 or 20 years of work of trying to find out how to define robustness, how to characterize it, when distributions are shifting, when people are adapting to that, when there's strategic agents, because uh, that really is the real world engineering problem. And I definitely wouldn't want to hint that I've solved any major part of that. Um, but I don't think that anyone has, and I think it's somehow, uh, you know, it's been kind of uh, channeled into, let's just work on like adversarial learning and, we, and we'll, we'll handle the problem. You know, I think it's really, um, you know, it, it's a multi-pronged beast, just like fairness and, you know, is too. It's not just one problem, it's many, many problems, part of which have economic side to them. If you don't have the economic side, then you really get in a situation where people can just do arbitrary things. Like I was talking about scarcity, you know, you copy the bits as much as you want and you kind of, um, you know, uh, you, you need to bring in that there's kind of some actual value and there's some loss and gain uh, to even talk about robustness. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. I think we are out of time for today. Um, that was great. Uh, All right. Very, very exciting agenda, I think. And yeah, have a good summer, I suppose. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye. All right. Are you muted? Sorry, uh, I'm saying we have another 15 minutes of break and then we'll reconvene for our last session here, um, followed by our last keynote. So we'll meet again at four.